please be seated. Well, we've been for 10 weeks or so looking at the benefits that we have in this life if we've been effectually called, if we're in Jesus Christ, if we really know him. There, there's quite a few of them. Uh, justification, adoption, sanctification, and then those additional benefits, assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance in that grace until the end. I have emphasized that these are all benefits that you don't have to wait for. That if you come to Jesus Christ, these are your benefits now in this life. But uh, this week, we're going to begin to look at the benefits that God has for his people that are yet future to us. These are benefits that we have to wait for. While it's very important to recognize all that we have in this life through Jesus Christ and to rejoice in what we have in this life, we err greatly if we only look at the benefits that he has given us in this life. Paul even goes so far as to say of himself as an apostle that in this life, if in this life only we have hope, he says we are fools for following Christ. We can see this even with Abraham, the model of the believer. He was promised an inheritance that he is not going to get until Jesus returns. He was not given a scrap of land. He said, well, well, his children were given the land. Yeah, but Abraham was gone then. Abraham doesn't get it until Jesus comes. Why did he leave the comforts of home and obedience to God and to serve God all those years if his reward was only in this life. It was a foolish decision if that was it. But if there is an eternity, if there is a city whose builder and maker is God that's eternal in the heavens, and Abraham left to seek that city, then what he did was extremely wise. If you think about it, all the blessings that we have in this life are only blessings if they flow into the eternal blessings that God has promised us. They're, in a sense, like seed that grows into a plant that has the fruit on it. It doesn't really blossom until we receive our eternal inheritance. I mean, think of Moses in the wilderness with the people of God for all those years. That was no life, except that it was attached to eternity. It was attached to the blessing, the city that God was bringing about through those people that were such a mess. And that Moses had to bear with for all of those years. What good is it, I ask you, to be justified if you never receive the eternal inheritance that belongs to the righteous? Why do you, would you really, why would it matter that much whether you're righteous or not? If you never get to come before God and see his glory in Jesus Christ, what's the point of justification? What good is it to be adopted if you never get to come into the Father's house to the place that He has prepared for you by Jesus Christ? Where can you live where you can live in full communion with God? You don't have that here. What good is it to be sanctified if that sanctification is not completed? Perfected in glory. What is partial sanctification if that's where it ends? If you never shake off all the sin that darkens you and that that spoils you and ruins your life, makes you ugly and defiled. If that's never going away, what's the point? The blessings of this life are blessings because of where they lead. They have a destination. They lead us into the very presence of God in eternity to the beatific vision. And if they don't really lead us there, then these blessings are all lies. And we're all deceived, and we might as well pack it in. Why should we go on? It's like the farmer, you know, getting fake corn seed. And he sows this corn seed, and it's supposed to be the best corn seed ever. And he puts it in the ground, and he works it, and he waters it, and does everything that he's supposed to do. And then he never, the plants grow up, and corn never grows. It was, it was all a sham. 
Like, he, what, what was the point of it? He had this wonderful plant that was growing up, and it looked like it was all really something. But it never got to the goal of bringing the fruit that was the, the goal of, that, of having that corn. There, there was a promise and steps along the way, but you never got what you were looking for. Perfect communion with God, with his people in paradise. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the benefits that God will give us future to us. This week, we will look at the blessing we have t- attained in the mysterious time between the day of our death and the day of the, our resurrection at the last day, what is sometimes called the intermediate state, because it's an in-between time between this world and the next. And then the next week, we'll look at the benefits that are ours as believers at the resurrection. That's the final goal. So let's begin by confessing together question 37 of the Shorter Catechism about the intermediate state. Question 37 says, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory. And their bodies being still united to Christ do rest in their graves until the resurrection. For our scripture reading that's related to this, I've selected 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So give attention to this. This is God's word. And it tells us about that intermediate state. What happens after you die, yet before the resurrection. 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and and I also trust are well known in your consciences. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy and infallible word. Let's begin by looking at what happens when we die. That's laid out for us here in this passage. There are two things. Our body is destroyed and our spirit goes to be with God. It's what we read in our reading from Ecclesiastes as well, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 12, 7, speaking of death, it says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So the body will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Let's look at these two things. First, that at death, the body is destroyed. Look in 2 Corinthians 5 and you can see Paul refers to this where he refers to our bodies as our earthly house or our tent. So think of your body here like a tent, the house that your spirit lives in. He calls the body a house or a tent because it is where we live until it is destroyed. You see how he speaks of this in verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He is writing to encourage us there about the coming resurrection. He's telling us that even though these bodies that we have now are being destroyed, we have a building that God is going to give us by his divine power. 
not made with human hands. Of course, our bodies now are not made with human hands either. They were, they were made by God. But uh, he's talking here about this eternal, this new body that will be eternal. Next week, I'm going to show you that these new bodies that Paul speaks about here will be our present bodies. Whatever is left of them, and however God does it, remade into bodies that will never die. I'll get to that next week. We won't go into all that this week, but we believe in resurrection, not reincarnation. Reincarnation is when you go from one body to a different body. Resurrection is where your body is raised up again. So that's the difference in the, in the teaching of the Bible. But for now, I just want you to consider what you already know, that these bodies we have are going to be destroyed. Of course, we observe that this is what happens to the dead. A person's body wears out and they die. And when the body begins to return, and then the body begins to decompose and to return to the dust, just like it says. When God first created the human race, he warned us that if we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and defiance of his prohibition, that we would die. And so after we ate, he came to us and said in Genesis 3, 19, to Adam, he said, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. You're going back in the ground, Adam, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, that's what you're made of, and to dust you will return. Dust is not going to be unified together in your body anymore. It's going to be scattered, is it, and that's exactly what happens. You say, how could that happen? Well, we see it happen, don't we? Body decays. It returns to ashes and dust. This is the destruction of the body that Paul is referring to in our text, our earthly house, our tent, if it's destroyed. It's a great humiliation for us because God made us to have dominion over the earth. He made us to control the world, the earth, the things of the earth for his glory and to harvest and cultivate it in ways that would be very glorious, beneficial to one another. And of course, we do that to a certain extent. He said, you'll bring forth fruit, but it'll be by the sweat of your brow. It's going to have a lot of trouble doing it now. And when we broke from him, we became oppressors and exploiters as well, so that most of our problem is ourselves, like the way we treat each other, our selfishness and what we do with the things that we produce in the world. They, it's, uh, it's a very sad situation. God took away much of the control that we have over the earth as well so that uh, now we are subjected to sickness. There's weakness in us. We're certainly mindful of that at the present time, aren't we? That's all we hear about. If you turn on the news, it's sickness, sickness, sickness. That's all you hear about. God sentenced us to death. He also changed things so that we must bear with Droughts, storms, injuries, things don't go the way that we want them to. We don't have dominion. We don't have authority over creation anymore. It does whatever it wants, <laughs> and we, we have to just bear with it. We can't turn off the snow when we want to or turn it on when we want to. Paul speaks of how we groan in the bodies that we have now, yet with hope. In verse 2, he says, in, in this, what's he talking about? In this body, we groan. Certainly we do. We get hurt. We have chronic pain. We get sick. We get tired. We spend lots of time and money trying to keep our bodies going. Huge industry. But it's a losing battle. They're falling apart. Even the people with the most beautiful, robust bodies all end up with their bodies destroyed. Many do not even make it from their mother's womb alive. Many are racked with infirmities. It's interesting now that I'm at the age that I'm at, some of the people that were the, you know, the beautiful stars that were on television and everything that were you know, 20, 30 years older than me when I was 10 or something, and now... Like, they're falling apart. Everything, everything's gone. So yes, we groan in these bodies. But as Christians, this doesn't mean that we should want to be freed from a body. Paul says right here, our hope is not 
that we would be unclothed. What does he mean, unclothed? Remember, he said, this is our clothing. This is our tent. We don't want to not have a body anymore for our spirit to have it taken away. We want to be clothed with a new body that's not falling apart, that's not rotting away. Paul was writing to Greeks, and it was a general understanding among them that there could be no paradise until we became pure spirits without bodies. Because they had the understanding that God doesn't have a body like we do, and he gets on quite well. And the angels don't have bodies like we do, and they get on quite well, so this would be a higher way for us to be. But no, God made us with bodies in his image. It's part of being his image that, that we have bodies, and it's a good thing. The reason the bodies are a problem is because of the fall and the curse. That's why they die and they fall apart. So Paul says, no, it's not our final hope to be, to, to be away from our body. Our final hope is that we will have renewed bodies that will not be destroyed. You can see how he describes it in verses 2 and 4, 2 through 4. He says, for in this body we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, our body, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For, see, we don't want to be naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, away from a body, but further clothed, that mortality, or that which dies, may be swallowed up by life. So our goal is not to be disembodied, to have no body, but rather to be given bodies that cannot and will not be destroyed. Nevertheless, there is a time in God's plan, because of the fall, when our spirit is separated from our body. And this is the second thing that happens to us when we die, that our spirit goes to be with God. So the two things again, our body rots away, decomposes, our spirit goes to be with God, returns to God who gave it. It is a separated from our body. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Our body returns to dust. Our spirit returns to God. James describes death this way in James 2, 26, when he says, the body without the spirit is dead. That's what happens. Your spirit or your soul, if you want to call it that, you can call it that interchangeably here, leaves your body. The life of you goes out of you, out of your body. This is a very unnatural thing. But it happens when our bodies wear out on us. Okay, so um, this is something that you can observe when you see the body of a person that has died. The body's still there, isn't it? But it's worn out. And the spirit is gone out of the body. Body lies there and there's no life in it. It is a body without a spirit because the spirit has returned to God. Paul refers to this in verse 8 when he says that to be absent from the body, okay, out, the spirit goes out of the body, to be absent from the body is to be where? Present with the Lord. The spirit doesn't go nowhere. It goes to God. So our body is there lying in the grave, rotting in our spirits with God. But this is not the final state, you understand. This is the transitional state that we go through until our bodies are raised. The Bible speaks about our spirits leaving our bodies to be with God when we die quite frequently. For example, when the body of Stephen, the first martyr, was being destroyed, he called on the name of the Lord and said, Acts 7.59, Lord Jesus, receive my body? No, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And when Jesus died, we're told in John 19.30 that he gave up his spirit. And he told the thief on the cross beside him in Luke 23.43, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, their bodies were both on the cross, weren't they? Jesus was taken down and buried in that body until it was raised up. So this, he said, you will be with me. What did he mean by that? With, with my spirit. We know that his body and the thief's body were buried. The two of them, however, went to God together. Their spirits returned to God. So you see what happens when a person dies. Okay, that's the first thing we're looking at today. 
that his body is separated from his spirit and his body is destroyed. But for believers, dying like this, having this separation, brings us into a situation that is far better than what we have here now. Let me show you how this is so. First, our situation is better because we're freed from these dying bodies. As we've seen in 2 Corinthians 5, 4, we groan in these bodies. There are bodies that are subject to illness, injury, weariness, and that fall apart on us, and we die. Even our brains don't work as well as they should. Sometimes they have serious disorders. So it's a great blessing to be free of these earthly bodies. Just think what a great relief it was for Jesus and the thief on the cross that I mentioned a few minutes ago with their backs shredded from the Roman scourge and with the terrible nails pulling and pinching the nerves and the bones of their hands and the feet and the weight of their bodies being supported in that way, with the dislocated joints and the thirst and the weariness and all that they were going through to be free, to soar away from the bodies of death, these ruined bodies, and to take flight with wings to forever be free of all pain and weariness. This is what you have to look forward to if you die in the Lord. But I must warn you all that if you are not in Christ, if you do not come to him for salvation, then though you're released from this body, you will be raised up also with another body, but it will be a body of death from which you will never be released. Do not fight against the Lord's call. Come to Jesus and be restored forever so you can be free of the body of death forever when you die. Now, let me show you the second way that it will be far better for us when we die. Okay, the first way is free from our body. Secondly, our situation will be far better because our spirit will go to be with Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul explains that as long as we're in these present bodies, we're absent from the Lord. It's a pretty huge thing. Verse 6, while we're at home in the body, as long as I'm here, we are absent from the Lord. So as long as we remain in these bodies, there's a sense in which we're we're absent from him, not with him. Now, I hope you realize what Paul means. Of course, he doesn't mean that God is not with us in the way that he is with us. We know that we are with the Lord forever. And this, when we've come to him, that we, are, we belong to him, as we saw even today with Peter, you know, are you, are you with Jesus? We are with him in that way. But he's talking, he's talking about uh, something different here of being present with the Lord in a more intimate way. Jesus told us when he departed from this world that he would send his spirit and his Holy Spirit would always be with us in a spiritual way. He told us that he himself would always be with us to help us by sending us the things that we need while we're in this world until the end of the age, helping us and blessing our work. And he is. But what Paul means is that we're not with him to the extent that we shall be when we go to paradise and are in his immediate presence. He explains what he means in verse 7 when he says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we're only with the Lord spiritually now. So we're, we know what he is because he's told us what he is and we believe what he says. But then we're going to be with him to see him. And to be with him in that way on his glorious throne, not just told that he's there, but seeing him there, beholding him with our eyes and hearing his voice, that will be a most wonderful change when faith will be changed to sight. Paul tells you that when you die, your spirit leaves your body and it will be far better because then you will be in the Lord's presence in this way. Because of this hope in verse 8, he says, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We can hardly fathom, fathom what it will be like to see the Lord face to face in this manner. But it will be glorious, and we we know that. But we know for sure that 
we know for sure as well that it will be far better than it is now. In Philippians 1.23, Paul speaks of his death as departing to be with Christ. And he says that he has a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So it's going to be better than it is now. Not just a little bit better. He says far better. That's the phrase that he uses. And indeed it will be to know him as the highest good and to behold his glory is the greatest joy. Our souls will be flooded with joy. And there are more, there's one more marvelous thing that will happen. Our joy at death will be, would not be full without this. When we depart to be with Christ, our spirit will be perfected in that day. In other words, we will become sinless in our spirit. There could be no happiness in the presence of God the Father and God the Son if we are still sinful. For one thing, seeing His glory when there is sin in us would mean that we would see His wrath against us. God hates sin. He doesn't tolerate sin. And it would mean that we would be too ashamed to look at Him. And it would mean that we would have no happiness before Him. We would not cherish Him if we were still in our sin. Hebrews 12, 23 describes those whose spirits have departed to be with Christ as the spirits of just or righteous men made perfect. So those that are righteous by faith now are made perfect so that they are actually without sin. It refers to those who have died with true faith in Jesus Christ, who have him now as their representative but he, he has atoned for their sins so that they're completely forgiven. And he has imputed his perfect obedience so that they are completely righteous or just in God's sight. But they are made perfect themselves at death. He perfects their spirit, making them completely free of corruption and malice. Never again will they sin. Never again will they have sinful thought, action, or desire. They are perfected forever. 1 John 3, 2, we looked at that when we looked at adoption. It says that when we see him, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. We can't begin to imagine what it would be like to be free from sin. This is another reason that Paul says that we are well pleased to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. So you see, there's a progression here. There's an improvement from the benefits that we have now in Christ to the benefits that we'll have when we depart to be with the Lord. We're going, things are going to be better. Even though it's not our final state when our bodies are raised up, it's far better than our present state. Though forgiven, we still have so much sinful corruption that remains in us, and, it, and we, drag, we have to drag these old dying bodies about with us. But what a glorious thing it will be to be absent from the body and present with the Lord until the resurrection. What tremendous benefits there are for us at our death. Okay, how helpful it is for us to know what awaits us at death as believers. Let me show you how it helps us to know that. How does it help us to know where we're going in, in that intermediate state? Well, first, it gives you great comfort when your loved ones die in the Lord. Of course, you're very sad. You miss their company very much. You've lost the joy and comfort of their fellowship that you, know, that you have with them. But what a marvelous thing to know that they are with the Lord. What a blessing to know that they are free of suffering and pain. What an encouragement to know that they are free from sin. And that what they're doing now is beautiful, glorious, they, they see the glorious revelation of the Lord. Now I know that many of you have relations that have died without the Lord. And that's a very painful thing. All the more painful for you because you know the Lord. It's a hard thing. But you must not let their unbelief harden you or embitter you toward your gracious Lord. He is still gracious even though people don't believe in Him. He is the Lord and He has done according to His sovereign pleasure. And you must not charge Him with wrongdoing. In fact, you must use the hard experience to bring you face to face with the truth that we all deserve the eternal wrath of God. And that even if he sent us to hell, 
he would still be a God of perfect love if he sent us all to hell. It would not mean that he was not a God of perfect love. He could do that and it would still be consistent with perfect love. What we see with redemption is a grace that is unexpected, a mercy that goes above and beyond love. You must see that his mercy in saving sinners is beyond all understanding, that that even one person should be saved and that their salvation should be accomplished by the suffering of the Son of God in their place. That is a marvelous, incredible, unbelievable thing. Yes, weep for the lost, but pray, praise your most merciful, gracious God for his incomprehensible love that saves even one sinner and that saves all who come to him, everyone. What a comforting thing it is to know that those who have died in the Lord, though, are with him in glory. That's the first way it helps us to know the benefits that come to those who die in the Lord. Secondly, it gives you great comfort in facing death yourself. Death is a fearful thing. It's not a natural part of creation. We think it's natural, but it's not. It's the result of the imposition of God's curse against sin. It's a terrible thing. It separates us from those we love. It's a great humiliation for us that our bodies that we saw before were made to be immortal and to live forever are now falling apart, and rotting, and returning to dust, and that the dominion that we have over the earth is taken away from us so that instead of us taking dominion over it, it takes dominion over us. But as Revelation says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, Revelation 14, 13. 1 Corinthians 15 reminds us that death has lost its sting for the believer. We can face it with the prospect that we're going to something that is far better. Like Stephen And millions of other martyrs, we can die looking to the Lord to receive our spirit, seeing that we are being transported to glory when that happens. How this ought to help us to be bold in the face of death. Paul says of his many sufferings and of the many threats upon his life, Acts 2.24, but none of these things move me, all those threats and things, they don't unsettle him. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. Isn't that interesting? He wouldn't finish his race with joy if he was all concerned about preserving his life. He's not all worked up about that because he's got, another, he's got an eternity ahead of him. It doesn't matter if he dies in the service to the Lord. Far better to die in the joy of serving the Lord than not. So he says... Uh, so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Did not our Lord tell us not to fear those who could kill only the body, but rather to fear him who could kill both body and soul in hell? If you're in the Lord, no one can really hurt you. And that's true. Also of cancer, airplane crashes, covid None of this stuff can really hurt you. You don't really need to be afraid of these things. All they can do is kill you. That's all. And then you're going to be with the Lord. Don't be afraid. You don't need to if you're in the Lord. It's far better to depart and be with Christ than it is to remain here. Thirdly, Let your knowledge of what it means to die in the Lord make you all the more eager to please the Lord. You're going to be with Him. You're going to come before Him as soon as you die. You don't want to be ashamed in that day. Let that soak in. You're actually going to stand before the presence of Almighty God. His glorious presence. You're going to live in his house before him as your father, as the bride of Jesus Christ. Get yourself ready for him. When a bride is getting ready to marry a man that she loves, she gets herself ready for that. Fill your life with those things that please him. You're going to him, so spend your life preparing to meet him. 
Since we're going to be present with him, Paul says, make it your aim to please him. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.9. He says, therefore, because we're going away from here to be with him, make it, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. He is the gracious, holy Lord of glory who has taken you to be his own. You belong to him. So stop goofing around and start living for him. Pour yourself out for him. Verse 10 reminds you that he is not at all indifferent toward how you live. God doesn't say, oh, I don't care how they live, whatever. He doesn't say that. It says, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the good things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. He is watching you, and he cares about what you do or don't do. He delights in rewarding you, and he will expose all that is amiss with you. We have seen that he pours out his grace on us to help us to live for him, so that we can start living for him. There is no excuse not to. It won't hurt you one bit to live the rest of your life to please him. Pray Colossians 1, 9 through 12 earnestly that you, Paul praying for the believers, pray this for yourself, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why do you want to know God's will? Verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We have an inheritance with God. You belong to him and soon you'll be with him. So live to please him you're going to be his bride forever and finally dear brothers and sisters knowing what awaits you when you die ought to stir you up to do all you can to persuade others to come into this blessing you know how much he hates sin you know what your sin brought upon our dear lord jesus you know that he is a holy judge whom every soul must stand before before whom every soul must stand and be tried. This being so, 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Persuade them what? Persuade them not to be, before it's too late. Persuade those in the church who appear to be losing their way. Persuade your children. Persuade your loved ones before it's too late for them. Let me say to you, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You do not want to die outside of Christ with your sin still clinging to you, unpardoned, condemned to hell. My friends, just as we cannot begin to imagine the glories of heaven, so also we cannot begin to imagine the horrors of hell. You are going to die. After that, you will be judged. You cannot stop judgment any more than you can stop death. They come together. It's going to happen, and you must prepare before it's too late. You are a sinner before God, and you cannot save yourself. You cannot atone for your own sin. Nor can you live the life that God requires you of you. But bless God, Jesus has done that for all of his people. He has atoned for their sin by his cross, and he has lived the life that God requires for them by his life. He has started a kingdom for rescued sinners, for anyone who will come to him. It is such wonderful news that a kingdom like that even exists. He promises to receive you if you will turn from your sin and come to him. You won't be perfect. Not now. You can't. That's why you must come to him so that he can do the saving. He does the saving 
better than you can. You can't. Come and put yourself in his hands for salvation. You do not want to die without his salvation. But what a glorious thing it will be to die in him. How, we, how he will welcome you in that day. It will be far better. Please stand and let's call on his name. Oh Lord our God, how thankful we are that you have prepared a place for us, that when we die, that we leave these dying bodies, these rotting bodies. Our spirit lives on. If we are in Christ, we go to, to be with you in a glorious, marvelous way. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to live now in preparation for that day, for this is where we're headed. Father, we have an inheritance, an eternal inheritance. We see how Abraham and Moses and different men that lived for that promise that you made. They walked by faith and not by sight. We don't receive the inheritance now. We don't receive our new bodies now. We don't receive our perfected spirits now. But these things are yet ahead of us. And we pray, Lord, that as we have received the blessing of salvation in this life, that we would also look for the blessing of the full salvation that is yet to come at death and resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that those that have died before us, that are believers, that though they are absent from the body, they are present with you now. We pray, Lord, that we would be gathered to our people in that way also in the days to come. We know that the gathering, when we're gathered to our people, now is described as our gathering to Christ. Before he came, it was the gathering to our people. But now he is there, and everything revolves around him as the center. We thank you that those who are, have gone ahead of us are rejoicing that they have advanced. They haven't gone backwards. They've gone very much forward. And that we look forward to that, Lord, in the days to come. So please, Lord, prepare us for this very thing. Help us to serve you faithfully now, without complaining, waiting until that day patiently, when you will call us home. But help us, Lord, not to be afraid, not to be trying to hang on to our life in some desperate, grasping way, but, Lord, to simply serve you and to leave those matters in your hands. You will do what is good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive now his blessing. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.